So I'm Catherine Gall, and I'm head of business development and partners for Cellnex today. Cellnex is um, a company that is Europe's largest tower co, located in 12 countries. In addition to that, Cellnex has a business um, that was, they purchased a company called Edgecom, which was a um, Finland-based business that focused exclusively on private networks, really starting around in 2014. Um, and so what I do is I work with the team on developing new business and new partnerships. So in a way, we're going to talk about partnerships, a little bit about um, mobile operators, and a lot about how private networks work. So thank you, Annie. Hey, and uh, Jay, are you? could you go next and just say a little bit about yourself and your role in the company? Hi, um, so I'm, I'm Jorge Jet slash Jay Velez. I, I work out of Telus Mobility out in Canada. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of our journey, how we got to private networks and what actually we're doing with private networks today. And basically all the challenges of, you know, managing the multiple RANs, multiple cores and multiple technologies. Thank you, Joe. And Yogesh, can you just introduce yourself, please, and say a little bit about um, Tele2's role? Sure. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Yogesh Malik, and um, I am the CTIO of Tele2. Uh, Tele2, we as a group operate in the Nordics and the Baltics. Uh, so it's... Um, a lot happening when it comes to connectivity and beyond connectivity as well. Um, we operate with technologies of fixed mobile, uh, of course, 5G, uh, but also TV and IoT are a very, very integral part of our offerings. Um, and what uh, I am uh, sort of hopeful of this conversation, because it's so diverse, uh, entry points in the panel is that where are we heading towards? Because as we are entering into this, that is the thing which really, so it's the journey, but more toward the vision of uh, self, both provisioning, healing, but also workload movement. So I think that is uh, uh, that is the area where I would like to get an input as well as we progress on this journey. Thanks, Annie. Thank you, Yogesh. So I guess there are two things that really struck me about this topic. And the first is, even though its focus is on the operator's role, this is like an ecosystem play. And, you know, so that's that's how an operator functions in that environment is quite an interesting question, I think. And I think the second thing that's interesting is we are maybe not as far down the road with 5G private networks as we thought we would be by now. Because looking at a GSA report published in November, I think it reckons there are 1,257 private um, networks um, deployed around the world, but more than half of them are LTE. Um, another roughly quarter is LTE and 5G. So only 23% uh, um, pure, if you like, 5G. Um, so that isn't where we thought we'd be. So maybe, um, Jay, if I, I can um, start with you, I'm wondering about as a design person, you come at this from a design perspective, um, what are the use cases? I'm wondering whether it's business cases and use cases and how clear they are that's holding progress up or whether that's your perception or not. I don't know. How do you approach this? Really, so the, the challenge is we have, officially we haven't actually launched 5G, but we, we have had the benefit of uh, running uh, multiple cores for multiple okay i'm products. sorry to interrupt you we're getting a lot of crackle suddenly on your audio really? i don't know why because you were fine before okay really? I think it's okay now it's fine now sorry okay. i beg your pardon nothing has changed on my end maybe my bandwidth <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, like I was saying, you know, we've had the benefit of actually running multiple cores on our on our public cores for for our different services, and 
running the multiple cores, we actually have managed to isolate our, our resources, our experiences, our use cases, and so on. Uh, when we came to the private network, and this is, you know, no secret, we haven't, haven't actually launched 5G yet on the private network, but we actually have uh, the challenges of, for example, Canada being such a large country, we have challenges with um, locations, right? We have a lot of mining, we have a, a lot of energy, uh, but these are very remote areas where coverage is is, is also very scarce. Um, so build, building uh, investments is has been a lot of these challenges. The use cases for, for most of these uh, customers are mainly around latency and making sure that you know, they have, uh, whether it's autonomous vehicles or whether it's tablets and so on, the ruggerized devices. Um, these are, these have been some of the challenges we've had to factor in given where the areas are, uh, the density of the locations as well, being forestry. Um, one of our, one of our, our use cases that are fairly interesting is we're actually in first responders. Uh, we've had quite a numerous, uh, forest fires this year and we've actually managed to deploy private networks. Uh, sort of uh, ad hoc. So through a container, you, we can provide uh, both RAN coverage and core coverage and backhauling everything through through satellite. So that's been sort of the the the, the model we have. We actually offer three grades of, of private networks. We, we The rapid deployment for first responders, we have an enterprise grade for those that, are, that have a moderate SLAs, but still require private isolation for networks and we have an, a carrier grade where you know reliability resiliency and and uh, and redundancy is fairly important with a very very aggressive SLA okay so maybe just the lumping of private 5g networks into one thing when there are many potential variations and types of quality and different applications is a bit maybe oversimplifying looking at this sector anyway. Okay. Um, Catherine, I think you're a good person to talk to about the sort of um, ecosystem and you're looking very much at business development and partner management and jolly good luck to you with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm yeah. just wondering how you um, position yourself in the market and how you view the market. So I think we talked a little bit about, um, we, you alluded to co-opetition. Yeah. So I think that is definitely something that exists in this private 5G world where some of our partners potentially could be our competitors in certain areas. And we're partnering with them for a variety of reasons. But also it's it's in my mind, it's so important to have that ecosystem. And some of that ecosystem we bring to our customers, such as, you know, an AGV provider called Omron, which who we partner with, our vendors, who many of them we're very close partners with. And then we have other partners that are coming on board that actually will serve our customers. So that's that's one thing we bring to our customers. But the other thing that we do is we really look at it from an end-to-end -end perspective because there's no business that is alike. A, a manufacturer or let's say a port, one port may choose a particular manufacturer of cranes, autonomous cranes that has a certain kind of um, PLC with it. Another may choose another. And so because of that, you've got to remain maybe not as integrated, but flexible and how you get their customer from point A, point a to point B. Um, but finally, what is, you know, what what are we looking at for for the customer? It's really to meet their business needs, which could be everything from doing something like autonomous guided vehicles, et cetera, to just basic connectivity. And I think what's really driving that 4G, 5G story is what's available. Is 4G, 5G available? And what in what form is it available? How how is it possible for the company to acquire that spectrum? Is it through a, a mobile network operator? Or is it through the government? And then what are their requirements? Sometimes they meet, sometimes they don't. Okay. And, and what about the roles? I mean, in all situations, I mean, I imagine somebody has to be to lead this, to lead each project. I mean, is it typically you? Is it typically the operator? Is it the customer? I mean, how does that work out? Or is every case different? 
I think every case is different and it really depends on the the what the customer needs and the motivation. We lead a lot of them. We've been doing this for 10 years. And I think, you know, where we have seen real changes is we've been able to take our customers from 10 years ago and take them on that transform- transformative journey from 4G to 5G, adding use cases, um, adding capabilities and really helping them with their digitalization journey. Interesting. So thank you. Uh, Yogesh, you were talking about you'd like to look at how you got to the point you're at, which kind of suggests that um, to uh, deploy 5G private networks, there are a lot of ingredients and a lot of uh, experience and knowledge needs to come together um, to meet the requirements. Do you want to talk about that evolution? Yeah, happy to share. Actually, uh, let me start with uh, our purpose uh, as Tele2. Our purpose is to enable a society with unlimited possibilities. So, and, and you can see that private networks uh, stands right also in, in that journey. What we see, we have clients which are mission critical providers, uh, whether it is law enforcement agencies, whether it's airport authorities, uh, air forestry, uh, electric boats, um, and Sweden is a pretty large territory as well. Um, so latency does count. Uh, but what is more important is to see what are we here for and manage services, managing end-to-end, providing solutions which are not only from connectivity, but take the connectivity to the next level is where we are on in that journey. So in that ecosystem, our value proposition is that we are here to bring a technology, which is not only the access technology, but we are able to take it all the way to the CRM. We are all the way to the data lake so that we can give an end-to-end proposition to our customers. And that has been the changing value proposition. And 5G definitely gives the latency advantage. 5G definitely gives the throughput advantage. Uh, 5G definitely gives this autonomous uh, vehicle uh, uh, vision coming coming to fruition. But where our efforts are on the self provisioning layer, Our efforts are, how can we make sure that self-provision leads to self-healing? So network and IT combining together along with data and using AI smartly on that is the way we are thinking. And and we, we have seen certain cases where we provide this full suite of services, we can really nourish that ecosystem. But I have to be also very clear that the market is developing is maturing. So we need to earn the trust of our customers. We need to think in their problems. We need to think about their workload together with the macro workloads. And we have to then see how we can bring reliability, security, and robustness while serving the customers and the customer's need. So that's the way we are thinking. Sorry. So if I've understood you right, you're talking about private 5G networks very much as a sort of isolated segment of your macro network. Is that right? Rather than a discrete separate entity. And confusingly, we use the same words, private network, to describe. Yeah, I, I think private networks has multiple flavors. Uh, we have been yeah. doing connectivity with 4G as well. And 5G we are doing in the macro network while we are doing in the in the indoor locations. And private networks has more than just a connectivity element. That's where I'm coming from. It's edge and compute. It is about provisioning. It's about the customer self-handling and uh, self-care, if if you may. So imagine you are a big factory, you're a big mine, or you are a big forest enterprise. You would be able to handle things yourself and will use the combination of the macro features and on-site features to be able to deliver that end-to-end service in a better and more sustainable manner. 
So there's been a lot of talk about being able to do this for a long time, the self-service at enterprise level, so that customers can um, uh, provision what they want when they want it, rather than they have a rigid set package. Um, how far, how close are you to being able to offer this to customers? Uh, so uh, let me give you an example. Like we have uh, community services. So we provide connectivity across the community called Karlstad and, and other communities in Sweden. And, and what we see is they can self-serve themselves because we open, uh, we are opening the interface for self-care in such a way that they can provision and care about themselves and of course, if they need help, we have the call centers. So and are you talking about consumers here? No, enterprises. Enterprises, enterprises have right. their... Like a pardon. Okay. Absolutely. So enterprises have their need, and we should be able to let them provision whether it is data handling, whether it is service handling, or whether it is connectivity handling. And all that is a package of the full service which we provide. And is this is this uh, community? Is it a kind of pilot or experiment, and then you're going to deploy this approach more widely? No, we have done that right now. So yeah. for us now is to go into industry by industry, and so now we are very much into the air forestry industry. We are very much with the electrical boards, with airport authorities, and law enforcement. So that's the way. And on top of that, we are looking into healthcare now. How can we take the IoT to the next level as well? And in that also, how can we provision analytics in, in a much, much faster manner? So 5G and beyond really helps us because that reduces latency to a very big amount and, and increases speed and a lot of additional features. Okay, thank you, Yogesh. Um, Jay, uh, Yogesh's mention of healthcare makes me think of Talos, because I know you're really big in the healthcare sector and you were super quick off the mark there. Um, I'm interested in this. Um, Yogesh is saying he's going to, the approach there is going to be vertical by vertical. And I'm thinking, does that make it really tough to scale? And don't you need a kind of horizontal platform where you're only customizing the last bit? I don't, or do you think it needs to be a different approach per industry or area? Well, well, one thing that, that Yogesh did touch on is the self care, which is like yeah. the, the automated sort of yeah. ecosystem. Um, the, the actually through uh, our RFP, one of the very you know, key uh, elements is we, we're actually thinking the, the approach of deploying 5G localized. So not through our public network. It's not going right. to be a slice or, no. or, 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 or any part of it. It's actually be, going to be localized to the customer, given that perhaps we also may have some geographical challenges with latency and so on. Uh, but that that particular is we're very focused on the scaling. So whether the customer goes through the, the sort of sales scale um, and onboards, you know, a thousand devices, whether tomorrow could be 10,000 devices, the network will actually converge and scale up based on the customer needs. Also through edge computing and, and through, you know, various of their use cases, we want to ensure that this is all automated and this is all sort of instant. Um, yes, like Yogesh uh, alluded to is, is the, is the um, analytics. Analytics now has become sort of the key factor for these customers, especially when they're scaling up a lot of their services and they want to continue to have that same um, performance on their on their network, as whether it's you know a thousand or ten thousand uh, subscribers on, on on their on their coverage. So analytical feedback about network performance is critical because you want to maintain that performance no matter what what's going yeah, on. And the customer wants to see it, right? They want to see this live. They want to see as much real time as possible, ensuring that you know the network is performing as to their requirements um it's it's very time sensitive nowadays everything is now instant and now it's it's and slas right slas have been become a very hot topic for us where you know what how we perform is is crucial to the customer and you know we do have thresholds that we have to meet consistently meet and and, and abide by by the customer needs 
And Joe, would you say that latency, that timing has become much more important in the last few years? Do you think that's something that's changed? Well, yeah, with, well, with autonomous vehicles what being one, you know. Uh, yeah, you, you know, can't have a second delay there. It'd be quite exciting if you did. <laughs> I said a second's delay there could be quite exciting. Well, yeah, and it's not only cost effective, but it's actually a, 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 in, a, in a safety sector, right? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, in, in the car industry today, well, this is a bit of a, outside of the the the, the uh, uh, private network, but in the car industry, you know, telematics and you know safety is is crucial. Uh, if if an airbag deploys or if there's an incident and so on, um, you know, the the back the call center needs to be notified instantly or as soon as possible. Um, also, you know, with with self driving, with autonomy, um, any any delays or any stoppage of of manufacturing or production can be a costly um, a cost a costly um, you know task for for the customer. So latency always needs to be you know at a certain peak uh, throughput as well, and and real time analytics is you know the combination of everything you know is is important to the customer and is important for their for their manufacturing and and their production. Okay, and autonomous vehicles in a private network setting are likely to be very large, scary machines in mines or in ports, for example. Um, which need to be under very serious control at all times, I guess. Catherine, you look like you had a few things to say during that. <laughs> You're on mute, though, unfortunately. <laughs> Again, to, well, to your point about um, the different uh, sectors and going after the different sectors and the self-healing, I think, it, you know, self -healing, uh, or self-care is very interesting um, but it depends on the industry, where they're located, what sort of people they have on site, et cetera, that are, be able, are able to provide that self-care. And so, therefore, the, what we look at is how we design the network so it meets their needs with very little intervention, both by us and by the customer in real time. And being able to um, design a network that meets the SLAs that they require, whether it's upload, download, latency in a certain location, number of devices, number of vehicles, um, the way that the antennas are are put on those vehicles, etc. So it is it is um, it is it's scalable on the one hand, on um, because the how you design a network for a private network is pretty standard based on what kind of SLA you're looking at, but then where you put things and how you tilt things and how you make sure that you're able to, let's say, reach all those different devices, that's where it's different. And then also you have, you may not have those people who can even do self-care on the site. You might just have a lot of vehicles and a couple of people who are running some systems. And so it really depends on the, on, on the location, I think, and, and the sector. Mm -hmm. Yoga, yeah, sure, looking yeah. thoughtful. So, no, I, I am thoughtful because I don't think we understand self-care. Uh, self-care is like you care for yourself on your mobile called digital interface that you can see how many users are there, what are they using, analytics real time. But I do agree that the SLAs, uh, they need to be aligned. And so I think we, we need to see end-to-end -end private networks. That's where at least we are heading towards. Scale needs to be there, but we need to be end-to-end -end, uh, thinking. Uh, so, yeah, guess if yes. I have a private network provided by Tally2, yes. do I need to be in the factory or at the port or at the mine to have self-service to provision services or change service requirements for that private network or can i do it remotely and if absolutely it's remote, remotely it does remote introduce, potentially introduce latency uh, no because uh, we, we are talking about two different areas provisioning happens locally enablement happens in a remote or locally uh, as you want so, and I think that is the kind of intelligence we are talking about. That is the kind of mobility we are talking about. And certain factors which are very local, 
then those provisionings happen locally. And then the latency from the central command to the local execution is something we need to take care with our data centers and the compute. And so I think we, we are talking about access, we are talking about compute, we are talking about uh, the IT systems, and we are talking about analytics. And these can be aligned depending upon the industry. So some things are very common. Across the vertical, something can go easily, while some things else need to be developed vertical by vertical. So I think we need to be very smart here so that we don't load expenses on the private network's creation while we use experiences in cross-industry. And I think that's the way we are encouraging a thought process which can be both scalable, but also we can share best practices in analytics, especially. Okay, Jay, you were looking thoughtful when Yogesh was saying that. And I'm just thinking about what a huge country Canada is and how remote your logger is or your oil company or your whatever it is. Um, and that whole thing of latency if the self-service is remote. The, the, the self it's, it's 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 more about um, being able to you know autonomous well, being able to independently provision independently scale independently. You're crackling within. badly, Jorge. It seems to me when you come forward, I think maybe I'll, I'll lean back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry it, to interrupt you. Yeah, so it's it's about being able to provision, even being able to scale up, being able to, uh, you know, meet meet your meet your needs um, without without the assistance of the operator. So unlike the consumer world, where you know you you buy your one device and you as soon as you have any issue, you call the call center and so on. Where whereas this IoT world now, you have your own portal, you have your own account, you have your own. Um, subscribers and, and all you do is is ensure that you you flag your services, you flag your 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 use cases for for your subscribers. Now you can have different subscribers with different use cases. For example, you can have some that would ha require voice, some that don't require voice, some that require you know critical latency and so on, and some that don't. And this is where where it comes to the customer being able to sort of manage. Their, their 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 subscriptions manage their their devices and manage their 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 their, their use cases um this is where it come it comes through it's it's not like um for say it, it's not that you it's a it's a it's a type of of of, of provisioning it's it's really it's end-to-end -end, you know independently without the operators now uh like yogesh also mentioned that if the customer does run into any problems there is a call center that can provide that kind of support but it's giving total independence and total autonomy to the customer to be able to manage all of the subscription and even with 5G now manage their, their use cases on, on the scalable network. Okay, so this is um, this has been talked about for a long time, but it sounds like now it's doable or right on the cusp of being doable for enterprise customers. Right, a lot of it is already doable, but even with 5G, it actually, it actually now brings the customer. Well, you need to step back a bit, Jorge, because every time you come in, it, your voice really breaks up badly. Sorry. How is this? Is this better? A little further back, I think. I'm not sure what happens, but your voice really breaks up. Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's so it's doable today, but now with the with the introduction of 5G, now even the network becomes even even more manageable at a customer level. Okay, I don't know. We're having trouble with your audio, but thank you. I don't quite know what to suggest, really. Um, Catherine, could you talk to me about some possible key partnerships and collaborations that you have or that you're seeking for 5G? Um, private networks and for network slicing, for example, for edge and to provide IoT solutions. So we have a we already have a variety of customer or partners that we work with on analytics and IoT solutions. Um, we're looking for more partners on AGVs and the integration of AGVs, and we are also looking at our customers 
and w- what they're looking for in their next generation of um, their digital transformations. So that could be anything from um, a partner that delivers um, a solution particular to a mine or particular to a chemical plant. We already have existing partnerships in delivering voice and push to talk over 5G um, and also um, a, a variety of other heavy vehicle customers actually or partners where we work with our mining customers on their heavy vehicles. So I think, and what we're looking for is more of that kind of thing because what's going to happen in the market is in order to enable these autonomous or next generation IoT devices, uh, management systems, um, digital twins, et cetera, companies are going to look to these companies and in turn look to the providers of the private 5G networks to enable these solutions and systems to work. So that's really what we're looking at right now. Okay. Um, So uh, I've got a a, a question here. Uh, One is, oh, actually it's more of an observation than a question, but uh, we've had lots of references today to latency, but reliability is really, really important. Like in the URLLC use cases, reliability and latency are critical. And I'm wondering how all three of you are approaching that issue. I think it's uh, absolutely critical. Absolutely. I mean, the, without that, it doesn't, it's incomplete. Uh, so, yes. Absolutely agree. And I think the radio environment does give that with the new features coming on, uh, does give give that also along with energy efficiency. Uh, so uh, you're not depleting a lot of uh, energy uh, just to serve that reliability in a very, very tight latency, but uh, you, you can achieve both. Uh, so yes, very much top of our mind. And actually for mission critical uh, application, Reliability, robustness, and uh, latency all come uh, together. Jay, you've been speaking about SLAs and the fact they're pretty, well, it's my word, not yours, brutal now. <laughs> uh, they're very tough to meet. Um, I mean, I guess reliability must be a key element in there. Right. Um, so for reliability, redundancy and resiliency is, is, is key, right? Uh, um, you know, the three always work together. Um, in redundancy, we, you know, we used to have this model of, you know, one standby and, and so on. With 5G, actually, we actually have a, a, a opportunity now to, to have a, a high, you know, dispersion of cores to ensure that not only the latency is, is, you know, available, especially on a, in, a, in a large country and a large geographical footprint, but at the same time, um, make sure that the handoffs and 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 the sessions can, are continuous with with keeping the latency. And at the same time, if there's any incidents within any of the network elements, you know, there are so many elements that are distributed across across the network that you know provides this this. Opportunity to ensure that reliability and and uh, sorry and latency is always available. So, well, Jay, is this uh, is the reliability and the latency is it, are improvements sort of because they're inherent in five G or do you design differently as well? There's are actually features in five G that actually. Yeah. Of the game for 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 both reliability and latency, um, you know the the latency standards of of LTE versus five G. You know there it's it is there is quite a, a substantial difference. Um, and now these features the the, the features that five G come, especially when it comes to redundancy and distributed cores, actually gives us the opportunity to ensure that you know that you have continuous sessions, continuous. Tra- uh, um, um, data and then at the same time, if there are incidents, it, this does not impact uh, any of your services. Okay. This also so, comes with the the umbrella of five G. Okay, so this seems like a good time to ask a question from Paolo, and he says, um, "Mobile private networks have four different types of architectures according to three GPP. 
And when we in the 5G context, which do you think, which sort of um, 3GPP definition um, is the most important? I can't even remember what they are off the top of my head. <laughs> I, I, I can't either. So I'm going to have to turn to Yogesh or Jorge. So. So I don't know. We're all Googling madly to see what they are. No, uh, it's, um, I think you, you, you have to look, of course, there are specifics, but uh, we have to look at it this way. Which are the main components? Uh, and I think the big with 5G would be compute at the edge, cloud, and back end uh, to be able to provision self care and do analytics. Uh, beyond that, uh, Jorge, maybe you you know that, and I'm uh, open to learn. But I think that whether there would be different constructs of those architecture, the components are the most critical one which we need to be uh, clear about. There's a radio function or access. I call that access function. On the site, there's the edge function. There's a cloud function, and there, there's of course I call the backend, but I think it's not just backend. It's all the CRM, it's all the product catalog, and going back into analytics. Yeah. So, um, so I agree with Yogesh on that. I mean, for five G private networks, the three GPP is going to be evolving. For five G, yeah. it's going to be evolving, and you know what we can get from one vendor, and then also the vendors' offerings, they're different. So, you know, it could be release 100, but the vendor wouldn't have, and I know we're not there yet, and the vendor wouldn't. I'm just the thinking vendor, how much that, trouble we've had with release 18, never mind. I know, I was, I was thinking that too. But, um, you know, a vendor may, uh, one vendor may offer some of the capabilities from release 16, some from 17. Another may, you know, not offer any of those capabilities. But I think the, the key thing is, is, is not, you know, not focusing on, you know, is it 5G, but focusing on what the capabilities are that the customer needs, how they need it, where they need it. To go back to this, this um, you know, um, this uh, reliability discussion, reliability is all about what you, how you've identified it to be to be required and how it's designed. And I know um, Jay mentioned, you know, um, uh, the, the core in different geographic areas. Um, you know, when, when a chemical plant sets themselves up, they look at where, you know, what do they need for electricity? Can they have more than one um, source of electricity? How, you know, how do they how do they have failover, et cetera? We look at the same sorts of things when we design a network. So it really needs to be, you know, what happens if a base station goes down? If a base station goes down and it's catastrophic, catastrophic then what we need to do is design it so if a base station goes down, the answer is nothing happens. And it's just, it's really, it's all about design in my mind. Jay, have you got any last thoughts on this subject about operator's role in uh, 5G private networks? Yeah. It's, Maybe uh, applications, we didn't touch so much on that, and XR and AR and all that stuff. But Yeah, it's, uh, if I may, Annie, it's, uh, oh, the okay. third uh, question is very interesting on 5G SA, and I would just leave uh, that that journey is still in progress. I think what is 5G SA beyond, because how does the ecosystem work with low, low frequency bands, with high frequency band, with slicing, with provisioning? And I think there's a huge topic. Yes, it has been in progress for the last three, four years. And, and yes, people have been in a race whose first 5G SA and stuff, but use cases need to drive that going forward. And we at Tele2 definitely believe that 5G SA is a real thing, but we have to be mindful on where to apply that as well and at which pace. Jay, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, so my my experience with 5G, you know, it is it has been overhyped and and you know invest investing in something that is sort of a brand versus a performance it is is a is a is a tough decision to make for many operators be given how much how much the cost of of not only the equipment the infrastructure but even your people 
Uh, but one thing we cannot control, and, and it's been sort of a challenge for us, is the maturity of the devices, the maturity of, of the customer willing to invest in their equipment to be able to acquire this performance or this technology or, or so to speak, right? That, that also, what's available in the market today, how much the customer wants to invest, and even how do you... How the logistics, you know, some customers may have a million sensors. The logistics of replacing and even upgrading a million sensors is, is a daunting task for the customer. So us as operators, we make the investment, we make the commitment, we're willing to work with you, we collect your use cases, we design, develop, and architect the best network we possibly can. But at the end of the day, half the battle belongs to the customer. Okay, we've run out of time, I'm sad to say, because I think this is a really interesting topic. Um, I'd like to thank all three of you, and especially for bearing with me as a short-notice substitution.